Thank you, Sue. Anyway, it's my very great pleasure to welcome everyone here this evening to our land in a changing climate. As Sue said, I'm the acting vice chancellor at Lincoln University, and I really love coming along to these events and uh, welcoming, welcoming people to our campus. Now, I've only got two minutes to speak, so I'm going to move pretty fast here. Um, I do want to very, very briefly just mention our guest speaker tonight is Professor James Rennick. He will be introduced by Anita Reeford. Now, James is a weather and climate researcher specializing in large-scale climate variations, and he's professor of physical geography at Victoria University. And it should be a great talk. He won the 2018 Prime Minister's Science Prize for Communication. Now, Associate Professor Anita Reeford is an applied economist here at Lincoln, specializing in responses to climate change. She is the only New Zealand lead author in the 2019 report on climate change in the land, produced by the United Nations International Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. And that, of course, is the world body for assessing the science related to climate change. So we're lucky to have two such illustrious people here tonight. Now, one of the things that I've been asked to do is say just a few words about what Lincoln University does in the area of climate change. And of course, it would be really difficult for me to do that over the period of time that Lincoln's been here, because we've been around for 140, 41 years, and we started teaching a course in meteorology in relation to land use way back in 1880. Now, I don't actually know what we taught back then, and I doubt if it was as sustainably oriented as our courses would be today. But we've been doing it for a long time. And I would like, I would like to talk just a little tiny bit about what the university's role is. Okay, and, and of course, a university in society is meant to generate, critique, and transmit knowledge. And generally, this boils down to research, science, and teaching. So examples of knowledge generation about climate, climate change, and the land that univers the university has been working on in recent years includes the following. And this is a short list because I don't have a lot of time. But the quantification and mapping of greenhouse gas emissions through the National Center for Nitrous Oxide Measurement based on our campus, it's part of the National Greenhouse Gas Center. The mitigation of greenhouse gas emissions from pastures in dairying farming through ongoing technologies developed by Professors Keith Cameron and Hong Di, and that is in association with one of our important partners, Ravensdown. Evaluations of the carbon footprint involved in the transportation of food from production locations to consumer locations, and this pioneering work would be known by many of you that was done by Professor Caroline Saunders of the AERU. Now, some examples of the transmission of knowledge include at the tertiary secondary education interface, something that Sue will know well, the establishment in 1990 of the university's long-running Enviro Schools program, which is for raising awareness amongst secondary students of environmental issues, and that includes climate change. Now, I do want to mention a little tiny bit about, uh, in fact, a, a really good example of transmission of knowledge comes from our postgraduate students. And just last week, we heard from Hannah Lecky, who graduated BSc Honors in Environmental Science from Lincoln in 2008. She went on to do a master's degree at Oxford University and is presently a policy analyst in the Division of Climate Change, Biodiversity, and Water with the OECD in Paris. Lincoln has also taken um, a very committed approach to attempting to uh, run the university in a climate neutral manner. We're, we're quite a ways from that yet. I need to be honest and say, yeah, there are things that we're doing that we shouldn't be doing. We're, we're putting together a strategic plan, and there's more than just a strategic plan at play here. So if you look at the roof or you look at the scaffolding that's on the cafeteria that's right over there, that is to put solar panels on that roof. We're going to put solar panels on all north-facing roofs on the campus. That'll take a little bit of time, but that's the plan. All of our new buildings will have ground source heat pumps. We're pushing, um, we lose our resource consent for the coal boiler in, in, um, in 25. That's too far away. We've put a stake in the sand. We're gonna try and get rid of it by 2023. Um, and we've got some advisors telling us how we might be able to do that. That will, be, that will require a, a wide range of things that we'll be doing. So we are committed to working as hard as we can. We're not there yet, but we're trying. Now, I'd like to ask Anita to, to come up and introduce Professor Ramstead, please. 
Thank you, Bruce. I, I th imagine some of you are thinking this is quite a convoluted process of introductions, but we will get to James eventually, I promise you. Um, it's a real privilege to introduce Professor James Renwick, and I feel I have quite a responsibility as it was advertised on the flyer that I will be re introducing him. Um, but I will afterwards also, we'll listen to James's talk for about 25 minutes, and after that we'll have... Um, a, a little discussion, I'll pose some questions to him before we open the floor to you all. So that's kind of my role. Um, I just wanted to also emphasise that this is a big week for climate change um, around the world, and this was why we chose James to speak today. Um, we Tonight, in fact, the, the latest IPCC special report on climate change and oceans and the cryosphere, the SROC report, will be released. So James has already done a few interviews for the media tomorrow morning. Um, so listen to the radio tomorrow. We've had the WMO report on the state of the global climate that was released earlier this week. And of course we have the climate strike on Friday. So this is a, an exciting time to actually make a difference. A few, <laughs> yeah, we'll have someone talking about that at, right at the end quickly too. So a, a few weeks ago we had the special report on climate change and land that Bruce mentioned that I was an author on. And I just wanted to highlight a couple of the main messages from that report that are relevant to, to this evening. So the highlight, really the main message is that land is under increasing pressure. It's already under pressure and climate change will make this worse. Um, what they also say is that we can feed the world and get energy from the land with the land that we already have in production if we take early and widespread action. So we don't need to be expanding into um, native forest and th places like that, but we need to start acting right away. And that was the message of the, the 1.5 degree report uh, that came out last year as well, that early action is essential. So Bruce has highlighted some of the great work that Lincoln University does in this space. I'd also add that there's a lot of work at the, other, at the end of environmental policy and decision making, thinking about economics, but also social processes in our research and teaching that adds, I think, that kind of the so what and how do we get this into action dimension into some of this research that we'll hear about. But that's enough from me, so it's a real privilege to have James here tonight. Um, James has nearly four decades experience in weather and climate research. His main field is large-scale climate variability and climate change, including the El Nino Southern Oscillation Cycle, the Southern Hemisphere Westerly Winds, and the impacts of climate variability and change on the Pacific, New Zealand, and the Antarctic. James was a lead author for the last two assessments of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and is a coordinating lead author for the new I sixth IPCC assessment. And I know having been involved in the IPCC that the coordinating lead author role is huge and terrifying. <laughs> um, and as Bruce mentioned, he's been recently awarded the Prime Minister's Prize for Science Communication. So we're really lucky to have him to here tonight. And I'll pass over to you now, James, and put everyone out of their attitude. Okay, yeah, can everyone hear me? Great, well, thanks for that wonderful introduction. Um, and it's, it's an absolute pleasure to be here this evening. Thanks everyone for coming out. Yeah, I know the weather's not the greatest, um, but there we are. That's Canterbury for you. Um, and yeah, I'm just, it's, it's a real honor to be at a university that started teaching meteorology in 1880. That's, I didn't know that, that's very impressive. That's, my original professional training as a trainee weather forecaster back those four decades ago that Anita mentioned. Anyway, so I've moved on to longer timescales these days and we're thinking about the next several decades, centuries into the future. So the title of this presentation is Our Land in a Changing Climate. Um, I'm hoping that when we get to the question time, Anita will be able to answer the questions about the land. I'd say she's more of an expert on that than I am. So. We'll see how we go, but what I'm going to talk about is mostly the global scale, how the climate's changing, what the implications are for our use of the land and our 
uh, our own societies. Uh, and I'll maybe touch on some more local things as we go along. But um, just check on the, what, what have we got here? Yeah, OK, yeah. So we'll get right into it. Um, Pressing the wrong button. It's on. Oh, hold on. I can just use the arrow keys actually. That's no. no, look, I'll just no, don't worry, that's cool. I'll just, just use these keys. <laughs> ah, great. Ah, wow, there we go. Okay, so, so what's happening? Well, here's one of the iconic graphs about climate change. This is global average temperature, averaged over around the world. Um, and each of the bars is one year, going back to 1880, which is about as far back as you can go to get a reliable estimate of the global mean temperature. So time along the bottom here, the last bar is actually this year, or what we've had of it so far. Uh, and the vertical scale is temperature change. The zero line is the average temperature before 1900, so it's a reasonable guess at what the pre-industrial temperature was. So what we see is uh, the globe is warming up. I don't think that's a surprise to anybody. And we've uh, seen the last five years, including this year, have all been more than a degree above pre-industrial. So the average at the moment is about 1.1 degrees above pre-industrial, so it's, it's pretty clear, and there's a lot of evidence all over the place. This new report that comes out tomorrow talks about melting ice, permafrost thawing out, ocean heat, all the rest of it. You know, everywhere you look, you can see the climate changing. Um, we experience climate change not so much in this way. It's not just a little bit warmer now than it used to be 50 years ago. What we really experience is extreme events, I would say. That's, that's what impacts on us and on, on everything on Earth. So things like sea ice melting in the Arctic. This is a sled dog team off the coast of Greenland uh, a few months ago. And there is ice under the water there. The, the dogs are actually still pulling the sled, but I guess it might be floating a bit. So hopefully that makes their job a little bit easier. Uh, but it's, it's pretty serious, the loss of sea ice in the Arctic how that's changing the whole climate of the high latitudes in the northern hemisphere. Uh, another big impact on human society, I'd say, is, is the increasing prevalence and risk of fires. This is a photograph taken in Australia last year. So in places that are already dry and already prone to fire, we're seeing big increases in the intensity, the duration, the area covered by fires, and there's an almost continuous year-round fire season in places like Southern California now. And um, heat waves, so the summer just gone in the Northern Hemisphere um, was pretty warm, and Western Europe had a, a big heat wave, I guess, a couple of months ago now. So people cooling off in, um, under a fountain just near uh, the Eiffel Tower in Paris, and Temperature records were being broken all over the place in Western Europe, and that's the kind of thing we'll see more and more of as the, as the climate warms up further. So these things are happening, and they're really starting to get attention from the public. And the conversation, the public conversation, has really changed. So not just the physical climate is changing, the, the political climate is really changing. And Anita mentioned this, but here's a, here's a photograph from last Friday in New York, just before that. UN Climate Summit that's on this week started. And we're seeing millions, literally millions of people marching on the street around the world, pushing for more action on climate change. So I see this as a really positive thing. You know, we do need more urgent action, definitely. And the only way you get that is through this kind of thing, I would say. I'll, I'll come back to that a bit later on. So just to run through, you know, so why, why is the climate changing, just very quickly some of the basic science. So the main thing where we get all the energy and the weather and the climate, it comes from the sun originally. So how bright the sun is, is one of the main controls on what the climate looks like. Um, but the other main control on what the climate looks like is what happens in the atmosphere. So the, the air around us, broadly speaking, is transparent to sunlight. So the, the sunlight that isn't reflected away by clouds and so on, comes straight through to the Earth's surface and gets absorbed by the Earth itself. So the Earth warms up, 
So it radiates energy back to space, just like the sun does, but because it's a lot cooler than the sun, the energy is a, has a different character of what we call infrared energy, heat, whereas solar radiation is mostly visible light and, and UV. And the atmosphere is not transparent to this kind of energy, to infrared. There are these well-known now uh, greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, water vapour and so on, that absorb this kind of energy. So that puts a warm blanket of air over the Earth, and that air radiates the energy, and eventually it gets back out to space. But in the process, um, about half that energy is radiated back down to the Earth's surface. So the Earth is warmed both by the sun, but also by the, the atmosphere, by the air around us, because it has these gases in it. So these are the two ways you can change the climate. Uh, either the sun gets brighter or dimmer, or the amount of greenhouse gas in the air goes, goes up or down. And if it goes up, if we put more carbon dioxide and so on in the air, we're putting a, a thicker blanket over the earth. And it's just like putting a thicker blanket over your body in a bed. Your body radiates infrared heat energy, and the thicker the blanket over you, the warmer your body is. Same story with the surface of the earth. So that's it. And we know that sunlight hasn't really changed in the last century or more, actually. Uh, it has gone up and down a little bit. It's been going down a little bit in the last 50 years or so. Uh, whereas the amount of greenhouse gas in the air has gone up a great deal, and that's what's driving the change that we see at the moment, that first graph. So here's how carbon dioxide has changed in the last 13,000 years. Uh, most of the information here, so we've got time along the bottom again, and carbon dioxide concentration up the vertical axis in parts per million. The green and the red come from ice cores in Antarctica. Conveniently, bubbles of air get trapped in the ice as it forms, and you can just melt the ice and measure the carbon dioxide and work out how old that ice, that, that air is as well. And that all, you know, it all lines up with the observations from Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii. That's the, the blue part of the curve. So we see this big rise in carbon dioxide concentrations in the last 250 years, roughly, since the start of the Industrial Revolution in the 1700s. And I show it on this time scale, you know, several thousand years, because this is the time scale the Earth operates on. If we stop the emissions today and we let the usual processes that happen in the climate system t take their course, it would be about 10,000 years before that spike came back down to where it was three or 400 years ago. So we've already change the climate a certain amount and it's going to remain changed for thousands of years into the future. Unless we find a way to actively pull the stuff out of the air and there's certainly a lot of people working on that. The other reason for looking at this sort of length of time is a big ice sheet takes about 10,000 years to melt or freeze and the deep ocean circulation takes hundreds to thousands of years to change and adjust to any change in heat content and so on. So to us, you know, in a human lifetime, you're really only looking at that, that blue part of the curve, and that's worrying enough, I suppose. But really, we need to think on this much longer time scale as to how the Earth responds. And the CO2, the, the reason I talk about carbon dioxide is because it's the longest lived. It stays in the air for centuries, thousands of years. Um, the amount we've been putting in, it, it, it's built up over time because it's so long lived. Most of the carbon dioxide that was released in the 1700s is still in the air. It just collects. But the rate at which we've been putting it into the air has gone up dramatically. So we've had about 130 part per million increase in carbon dioxide. The first half of that took about 230 years to collect. And the last half has taken about 30 years. So the first 100 years of emissions globally, that amount of carbon dioxide is, is what we released every six weeks last year. So the rate at which we're pushing the climate has increased dramatically, even in the time since the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change was formed, since I started working on this stuff. So we're only really starting to see the response of the climate system. And the amount of carbon dioxide in the air is higher than it's been for about three million years, so it's, it's a pretty unprecedented state for humanity. And the Amazon rainforest has been burning lately. I saw this quote from an 
American geologist a few weeks ago, I really thought it was very good, saying we're not just burning down the Amazon today, but digging up fossil fuels is basically digging up the fossilised remains of forests that existed hundreds of millions of years ago. So we're not just burning forests now, we're going back in time and burning all the forests from Earth's history that we can get our hands on. And we know now that is really not a sustainable thing to do. Another interesting fact about climate change is that most, and this will be in this report that comes out overnight on the oceans and, and cryosphere, most of the energy that's accumulating in the climate is going into the oceans, and that's because the ocean covers three quarters of the Earth's surface, and water is really good at absorbing heat. It has a very high heat capacity. So over 90% of the heating has gone into the oceans and will continue to go into the oceans. And only a tiny fraction, one of those bottom little slivers there, has what, is what has warmed the atmosphere, that one degree or so of warming. <coughs> this is really great news for us because if all of this heat had gone into warming the atmosphere, temperatures would already have gone up 50 degrees or so. So we'd all be dead. So there wouldn't be a problem, you might say. Um, so it's slowing down the rate at which we experience climate change. Um, but because the ocean takes so long to respond, it's, um, it's, it's, it's locking in change for a very long time, for centuries. And the big ice sheets in Antarctica especially sit out over the ocean. They have these floating ice shelves. So if you're warming the water underneath the ice shelves, then you're also running the risk of lots of sea level rise. So that's a summary, roughly, of, of what's happening. Um, the atmosphere is in a state humanity's never experienced before. The whole amount of heat in the climate system is increasing. That's everywhere, mostly in the oceans. And everything's changing. You know, the, the weather feel, felt quite chilly walking over here this afternoon, but probably a little bit warmer than it would have been on a similar day 30 or 40 or 50 years ago. The weather is just different now. Temperatures, rain falls winds, tropical cyclones, you know, all of these things are affected by the changing climate. And all ecosystems, including us, are affected by this. Oh. Pardon me. Just... <laughs> so this, this is something that humanity, that civilization at least, has never had to deal with. We've developed modern civilization in the last few thousand years at a time when the climate's been very, very stable globally. And sea levels haven't changed, so it's been absolutely fine to build all these cities right by the coast and trade using ships and so on, but everything is now changing, so we're going to have to respond to that. And I think that's, that's quite a hard thing to get our heads around collectively, that what happened in the past is just no longer relevant. We're back in a space like the Earth was at the end of the last ice age, where sea levels were rising rapidly and the climate was warming up. We didn't have seven billion people on the earth back then. So I'm not going to go on about this, but the future is pretty hard to read for, for us. I can tell you about the patterns of warming and all that. That's, that's relatively predictable, but how we respond, what happens to human society, I think is pretty, pretty hard to know. What are we going to do in terms of reducing emissions? How long is that going to take? And what will the knock-on effects be of, of all these changes on food security, water supplies, human society. But I think the, the positive message here is that what we do determines what happens in the future. You know, this rise in carbon dioxide is totally down to human activity. We know that from the chemistry of the carbon. And we're the ones with our foot on the throttle here. We can take our foot off the throttle when we choose to. If we do it now, well, that's good news. If we do it in 50 years' time, that's still good. You know, the climate is not going to reach some runaway state. That's not going to happen. But just the more warming we have, the more change, the more damage, the more cost. But it is totally in our control as to how much climate change we get in the future. All right, so what about the future? Here's the graph of carbon dioxide again. So, um, where we're at now, that gives you about 1.1 degrees of warming. That's what we've got today. And because this stuff just builds up in the air over centuries, 
and because we know how much we emit every year, you can work out pretty quickly, well, how long will it take before we've got enough in the air to get one and a half degrees, two degrees, whatever. And the numbers, when you work that out, if we do nothing at all, then we'll have enough in the air for one and a half degrees of warming in about 10 years, about 2030. And there'll be enough for two degrees in about 20 years' time. There'll be enough for three degrees of warming in about 50 years' time. This is all if we take no action at all, if we just continue to do what we're doing now. Um, it would take a bit longer for the actual warming to occur because, you know, the ocean slows things down and all that, but we would be guaranteeing one and a half degrees of warming in a decade or so. But if we take action, if we do globally what the Zero Carbon Bill here in New Zealand is talking about, um, getting to a 50% reduction by 2030 and, and a zero carbon future by, by about 2050, um, that... It's really... <coughs> These sound effects are really cool. What? <laughs> ah, oh, maybe I can just... Yeah? That, that amount of carbon dioxide adds up to the same as just emitting continuously for the next 10 years. So, you know, the, we again, we have a lot of power. We can really change the future and make it a lot brighter. Ah, oh, that's fine. I, look, I'll tell you what, what if I take this off and just use that microphone? Would that... Oh. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. Okay. People can still hear me, I take it. Yep, all right. And hopefully we've lost the sound effects. Um, <laughs> right, so, so I was just saying that, you know, taking the kind of action the zero carbon bill calls for, if this is done around the world, then we can stop at one and a half degrees. It's, it's a big ask, I'll get onto that in a sec. So it can be done. What would warming, different rates of warming imply, or different amounts of warming imply, getting on to sort of land use and so on. So uh, my colleague Dave Frame at Victoria and some of his colleagues at Oxford wrote a nice paper a couple of years ago now looking at temperature extremes. So what's, what's on this map here, these colours represent, they're actually standard deviations if, you, if you're into that kind of thing. So it's one, one standard deviation is a, a high temperature that's, that's, I think they called it unusual. So you'd see that kind of high temperature extreme you know, every 10, 15 years maybe, four or five times in your lifetime. At two, then that's what they called an unfamiliar extreme. So you might only see that once or maybe twice in a lifetime. And by the time you get to three, that's an unknown extreme. It's probably so high that you wouldn't have experienced that in your lifetime, however old you might be. So here, with one and a half degrees of warming, here's the map of the, this number. So in the tropics, where the temperatures don't actually vary very much, the year-to-year -year changes are quite small, the temperatures are already high, it's already warm, but temperatures are quite steady. So you see these changes compared to what we're familiar with more quickly in the tropics. So even one and a half degrees of warming, parts of the tropics or many parts of the tropics are in this kind of unknown zone. Down here, we're still back in the fairly familiar kind of climate. So that's one and a half degrees. Two degrees, it's starting to look considerably uglier. So the tropics are into this sort of five, six, seven, you know, extreme so high, they're just right off the scale. And even New Zealand, is getting into the unknown zone. Four degrees of warming, that's, that's really the top end of if we do nothing this century. Well, the climate is so different that pretty much everywhere on the globe, except maybe if you're <coughs> over the Southern Ocean off the coast of Antarctica or on the sea ice or something, if there's any left, uh, there wouldn't be so much change, but everywhere people live. 
the climate would be in a completely unobserved kind of state. So this, this is what we want to avoid. And the point they were making with this paper is that if we can stop the warming at something like one and a half or less than two, you know, we can avoid a lot of this stuff and we really want to do that. Uh, another key thing about agricultural production and human activity on the earth is, is water. It's probably the most important thing actually for, with climate change. And this, this graphic comes from a rather old IPCC report now. It was published over 10 years ago, but I like this figure. It still tells the story. So the brown regions are where... So this is runoff, so surface water, river flows, that kind of thing. Percentage change by the end of the century for a sort of middle of the road, two degrees, two and a half degrees of global warming kind of future. So all around the Mediterranean, lots of drying, the west of the US, parts of South America, southern Africa, Australia, even the north, northern half of the North Island of New Zealand, expecting to see quite a bit of drying. So this is this idea of the dry get drier. So the desert regions, such as a lot of Australia, southern Africa and so on, the Sahara, get drier over time. Meanwhile, the wet places like the monsoon regions in South Asia and so on get wetter. So you see extremes increasing at both ends of the scale. And some of the comments here, like stream flow decreases, blah, 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 um, water demand could not be satisfied after 2020, so this is you know, next year. And it's well known that the west of the US has been in a, a severe drought off and on, at least for several years, and, and snowpacks decreased and so on. So some of these things are already starting to happen, and I think this, this graphic captures a lot of the changes in, in water availability pretty well. And that those sort of changes, extreme temperatures, water availability and so on, translate through into effects on agriculture. And this, this is another global picture from the IPCC. So different, all sorts of different scenarios for temperature change and so on in the mix here. And a lot of different crop models. This is you know, rice yield in the tropics, wheat yield, various grains around the world, just all aggregated. And so what's shown here for different... 20-year um, period starting from about now, the greeny bluey bars are the number of model results that show an increase in crop yield, and the browny bars show the number of models that show a decrease in crop yield. So what this is saying is that at the moment, you know, for the next 20, maybe 10 years or so, it's a bit of a wash, you know, it doesn't really matter so much. But as you go through the century, the brown bars start to really dominate. And we're talking here about some of the models showing decreases in yield of somewhere between 50 and 100 percent, i.e. complete failure of cropping in some parts of the world. So the implications for food security are pretty dire, basically, as we go through the century, if we allow the climate to change as much as it's, it's doing at the moment. Now, getting on to this fantastic report that came out just a few weeks ago that Anita was an author on, climate change and land. It's very nice and you can download all this off the IPCC website. It's very easy to get at. So it looked in detail at things like agriculture, land use and what the implications are for things like ecosystems and, and food security. It's a great read. So just some of the points that came out of that report, some of the headlines and one of the ones that I think surprised a few people is that you know, I said before that water is really good at absorbing heat takes a lot of energy to warm the water surface of the whole of the water column up much. Land is not like that. The land surface has a lower heat capacity, it warms up more quickly. So this graph shows temperature change. Um, the, the lower one here is global, land plus ocean temperature, and the, the grey one, the higher one, is just land. So you can see that the land surface globally has warmed up by maybe nearly twice as quickly as the, ocean, as the global uh, figure has. That's because the oceans are warming much more slowly. So over land surfaces generally, we've already seen more than one and a half degrees of warming getting up towards two degrees back in 2016. So, you know, in some respects, we're already there in terms of this one and a half degrees of warming. Uh, these sort of diagrams have been a favourite of the IPCC for many years, the so-called burning embers diagrams. So the colours show, so show risk. I'll zoom in on one of them in a, in a sec. So risks to humans and ecosystems 
etc., etc. So what we've got here, water scarcity, soil erosion, etc., tropical crop yield decline. And the vertical scale here is temperature change. So it's not any particular scenario, it's just if we get this much change. So right now we're in this sort of grey zone about one degree of warming. And as you go from the yellow into the red and then the purple, you go from sort of moderate risk through to extreme risk. So things like the permafrost, already in trouble and likely to be in really big trouble if we get to a couple of degrees of warming and so on. So just zooming in on food supply instabilities. So at one degree of warming, we're talking about price spikes that affect individual countries. And this is already happening in, in Russia in 2010, in the US in 2012, in Australia with their crop uh, yield several times in the last 20 years or so. You get to getting on for two degrees, and we're talking about sort of regional food shocks. And then you get up to the, the really dangerous zone up around four degrees, and basically food supplies in big trouble globally. And you know, you can imagine the consequences of that if we have widespread hunger, famine, that could affect billions of people, you know, that I don't want to think about that future. So, you know, we really want to avoid these kind of levels of, of warming, absolutely. So this report has a lot to say about land use and how the land can be both a risk, a source of carbon, but also a sink. So w if we change the way we use land, it can help us a lot, what Anita was saying before. Um, so as a tool to mitigate climate change, we're talking about m possibly growing crops for bioenergy, and I know there's a lot of issues around that because that takes land that could have been used for producing food, uh, essentially. Reforesting areas that used to be forested but have been deforested. Afforestation, so planting trees where there weren't any before. So this is, this is becoming a big push. You know, New Zealand has this plan to plant a billion trees, and it's a trillion trees, I think, internationally now, globally. Um, producing biochar, so that's, again, growing plants, turning that into charcoal and putting it in the ground. Basically, it's a way of tying up carbon. And then, in terms of agriculture, maybe this is getting a bit closer to home, diversifying farming practices and reducing the intensity of things like dairy farming and especially red meat production has, has one of the biggest carbon footprints and one of the biggest water footprints of any kind of agriculture. So this report talked about the world going to a more plant-based diet. It didn't say everyone had to become a vegan, but move in that direction a bit is a good idea, I think. Or if we don't do these things and we continue to deforest and intensify farming and the soil becomes degraded through tillage and all that stuff, this could add significantly to the amount of climate change we get by just reducing the land surface's ability to absorb carbon. So can we stop at 1.5? Can I stop before I run out of time? Um, <laughs> yes, we can, but it's a huge ask. So here's time again from 1970. This is the amount of the number of gigatons of carbon dioxide released every year that's been going up rapidly. We need to turn that around and get to zero ASAP. So this is a, a pretty big challenge, but technically it could be done. So the report, the 1.5 degree report, has a lot of words. Just wanted to highlight it talked about rapid and far-reaching transitions that are unprecedented in terms of scale, but not necessarily in terms of speed. So this idea that, you know, at wartime an economy can be turned around pretty quickly. But we're talking about, you know, really changing the way the global economy works in the space of a few years, completely turning that ship around. So it's a, it's a pretty big deal. Um, so we need to get to zero emissions by 2050 and get halfway there in the next 10 years. That's got to be globally after 30 and more years of exponential growth. Um, but I think New Zealand can do this. You know, this is a real opportunity for us. We have a small economy, a small population, bucket loads of renewable energy, heaps of wind, water, solar. I think if any country can become completely renewable, then New Zealand can, surely. And I think we could be an example, an inspiration to other countries, and all of the small countries, the small emitters, if they got together, you know, we add up to 
30% or more of the total global emissions. So if all of the little players band together, that would have as big an effect as China and the US becoming completely green. And this could be good for the New Zealand economy, actually. You know, people might want to come here and invest to find out what, how we did it. Oh, I don't know if I'll read this, but I was reminded the commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the moon landings, the speech by President Kennedy in the early 60s. I really love this. You know, we choose to do these things not because they are easy, but because they are hard, because that will bring out the best in people, basically. And I think this is exactly the situation we're in now. It isn't going to be easy by any means, but if we get on with it, it can be done, and boy, will it pay dividends in the future. And this is the sort of thing that each of us can do. So the school strike, which has already been mentioned, happening on Friday again, you know, by all means, get out on the street, make a noise, and at least talk to people, talk to your family, talk to your workmates. Make sure everyone understands the problem and is prepared to at least put a bit of pressure on government to get change happening. And again, a nice quote that I like, Margaret Mead, the anthropologist from the US, um, this kind of thing is really what's driven social change, at least in the past. It's the only thing that ever really has. So there is a lot of power in the individual here. All right, so what if we miss one and a half degrees and end up at two degrees? That gives us, you know, we could do that and we've got a bit more time. It's probably, it's a lot more feasible, but there's a lot more damage that can occur. So the 1.5 degree report talked about how things like the Great Barrier Reef, tropical coral reefs would be basically completely gone at two degrees of warming, where we might at least save part of them at one and a half degrees. And we might trigger the irreversible melting of things like the West Antarctic ice sheet, this graph here, looking hundreds of years into the future with an ice sheet model. And the different colours are different scenarios. So this is one and a half degrees of warming, two and a half degrees, four degrees of warming by 2100. And if we don't stay on the bottom curve here, sometime in the next 50 years or so, the West Antarctic ice sheet starts melting irreversibly and we just can't stop it. And that might add five metres to sea level by 2500. Or if we really don't do anything, the East Antarctic starts to melt too and we might have 12 or 13 metres by 2500 and you know tens of metres more after that. So staying as low as we can minimises the risk of this kind of thing. Still better than three degrees though. So, you know, that's the message again that whenever we stop, it's a good thing. I would rather we stopped immediately, but if it gets to two degrees of warming and we're still thinking about what to do, well, it's still not too late, basically. Right, so we are entering, I'd say we're almost in a climate that hasn't been seen for a very long time, and this is affecting everything around us. Certainly the land surface, how we use the land, how we produce food, how we live our lives essentially. So we need to adapt to this, we really need to take this on board and, and plan for the future and be, be a bit dynamic about how we handle that depending on what surprises there might be out there. How we use land can either accelerate change or it can slow changes. So Smart use of, of the land surface that we have available to us is, is a really key part of all of this. And again, just getting back to that point that how much future change we get totally depends on what we do, how much more greenhouse gas we emit. So, you know, the sooner we stop emitting, the sooner we stop climate change. It's that simple. So that's the message I'd like to leave you with and hopefully the message that the political leaders in New York are getting at the moment, there's been a lot of talk about all this, but very little action so far. So let's just get on and do it. So there we go. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that talk, James. Some of those slides were very stark. I mean, I work in this space and even I was quite frightened by some of them. I was interested that you put up the burning embers figure from the, the land report because another one, an extension we did to that um, was overlaying the socioeconomic scenarios with them. And it just highlighted the difference in how the world evolves to the end of the century, like in terms of population and inequality and the level of, at, of risk at that 
at which we um, we can, I guess, deal with the different climate impacts on those different systems. So I'd encourage you to, to look at those in the report too. Now, I'm just going to ask you one question probably before we open it up to the floor. Um, so just bringing it back to where we are now, how do you see a future in Canterbury in terms of our, how we use our land and, and this kind of low, the ideal scenario in future to limit warming to 1.5 degrees, ideally? Yeah. Okay, well, I grew up in Canterbury and when I was a kid, land use was very different to how it is now and the explosion of dairy farming is something very new. So I, the way I see it, the future for Canterbury in terms of agriculture and land use is going to look more like it did a few decades ago when I was knocking around um, Christchurch and Canterbury. So more, <coughs> pardon me, more cropping, uh, more grains, uh, less, less red meat, uh, less cattle and probably sheep as well. Uh, there was quite a lot of sheep farming back in the day but um, Again, that more diversified approach and less intensive land use. I mean, I know there's an increasing number of people to be fed, so how you balance that off against the intensity of land use is a, a tricky question. But um, if the globe does go towards a more plant-based diet, I think that would, that would fit in. But then remembering the sort of physical changes to the climate that we're expecting, a drying generally in Canterbury, but at the same time, maybe more more water in the big rivers. So probably greater reliance even on irrigation than we have now. And increases in extreme temperatures. So I'm not, that, that's a bit of a wild card. If we see significant warming, you know, another couple of degrees, then those high temperature extremes might make it pretty difficult for a lot of the sorts of crops that we mm. grow now. So there could have to be some quite big changes in what, what we grow and how we mm. feed ourselves. Yes, yes, I and mean, I think that's an area that Lincoln University can really contribute to. I know there's researchers here amongst us and, and some of the work I'm involved in is looking at that kind of, um, looking at adapting to the impacts into the right. future. So I'm gonna open questions up to the floor and we only have, oh, we do have another roving mic, so that's great. So please wait until the microphone comes to you because we want to capture the questions on the recording, so. Great, thank you very much for that, James. Going back to that uh, agricultural question in Canterbury and, and wider, to me it strikes me we have an endless set of trade-offs in agriculture trying to address climate change. We have the issue of methane from ruminant livestock. So we say, let's get rid of the cows, some of the sheep. We say, let's do cropping. Probably one of the worst things you can do to permanent pasture is plough it up because the amount of carbon release from that in terms of these multiple trade-offs we have within agriculture, how aware and how much of that detail gets into these IPCC analyses? Oh, that's a great question. So when you drill down into the reports themselves, you know, and they're, they're pretty big times, and they're built on, all, all they are are summaries, really, of what's been published. So there's no new work done to get one of these reports written. It's just a a report on what the science community knows about all of this kind of thing. So yeah, when you look in detail, there is a lot of detail around some of those trade-offs and you know the details of land use and the implications for carbon storage and soil and, and so on. Um, but you're right, there's <sighs> we don't have infinite trade-offs and we certainly don't have infinite time. I know the agriculture sector, farmers are pretty adaptable. There's been huge changes in New Zealand in my lifetime. So, you know, smart people can do things quite rapidly, but not everything's, ad we can't adapt to everything. If, if change is too rapid, then it's going to be a big problem. Um, I can't really give you more detail on that because it's really not my area, but um, Anita would be able to perhaps say more, I'm not sure. Uh, I might just pass on to another question, I think, um, just to allow everyone. Um, we certainly know the climate's changing. There's a, a man across the road from where I live in Lincoln who was, uh, he was fought in the Second World War, so he's in his 90s, and he talks about seeing icebergs come down the Rakaia Gorge when he was a kid. Um, so that's interesting. But 
what I find uh, I can't quite understand <coughs> in the debate is that we talk about the melting ice sheets and Glacier Bay in Alaska has been extremely well documented since 1786. Um, it, uh, the ice covered uh, 1.3 million hectares then and there's been a lot of documentation since. And um, in, uh, in, 18, in the 1800s it was documented now the ice was receding at the rate of 900 metres a year and it was documented then by a mariner who took records of where the ice was and how high it was and some of that ice was 1200 metres high uh, back then and up until 1916 the records show that the ice was melting on average uh, just under 900 metres a year. Now that's just short of three metres a day. And I did some maths on that <coughs> and with the amount of ice that's receded up until now because that ice is now covers 25% of that area that if you take that volume of ice, assuming it's only 100 metres deep, then there's 2.5 millimetres of water has come from that melting ice on its own. Now, uh, so that's one point. Number two, that bay is not that far short of the Arctic Circle. So that ice was melting before we could have done it. Uh, number two, the Americans and, and the Russians off Siberia have done a survey uh, of in the sea off Siberia, 100 miles by 100 miles, that's 10,000 square miles, and they've found 100 plumes venting methane directly to the atmosphere, and those plumes are each over a kilometre in diameter. So my point, my question is this, that ice was melting before we could have done it. We know that that melting ice is releasing methane, so the methane was going to the atmosphere anyway, large amounts of it, and they said that's just a, a small amount compared to what they know is out there. So if the ice was melting and releasing methane, how do you differentiate the methane produced by the microbes that digest the, that organic matter and produce methane versus the ones that cows do? And how do you explain that that ice was melting at such a rapid rate before we could have done it? So I'd be interested in your comments. Uh, okay, so just to touch on the methane first, um, it's, it's hard to discern the sources of the methane and that's, that's one of the issues. There's a lot of work going on around that. Um, what we do know is that the amount of methane in the atmosphere is increasing rapidly and we know that intensification of farming is part of the reason for that, um, growth in wetlands, you know, rice paddies and so on, as well as natural sources and the, the thawing of permafrost in the Arctic, etc., is a major source of methane for sure. Fugitive emissions of methane from, from gr fracking and natural gas extraction, that's another big one. As far as the ice melt goes, yeah, I mean... It's for sure, we came out of the last ice age 10,000 years ago, the earth warmed up dramatically and over that roughly seven or 8,000 year period and regionally there have been warmings and coolings. So, you know, in some places, absolutely, ice has melted sort of naturally. But we know now the World Glacier Monitoring Service in Switzerland monitors hundreds of glaciers all over the world and uniformly they are melting and we know from modelling, from glaciological modelling of the, the ice caps and, and the glacier fields in places like New Zealand and Alaska that you can only explain that by increased greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So we know that really it's human activity that's accelerated melt that might already have been happening before the Industrial Revolution came along, but that increase in greenhouse gases is triggered melting in glaciers and uh, an awful lot more places around the world. Okay, we've got just a couple more hands, but we are running out of time. So please can I ask a couple of questions quite brief and targeted? So there's one question. Yeah, uh, kia ora, James. Thank you for your presentation. My, my question is about um, the policy prescription more than the science per se. And my interpretation of what you heard was that, you know, we should coerce or pressure governments into doing things. but isn't that what we've been trying to do for the last quarter century? Isn't, isn't the action for individuals? Because governments, in my view, have become more followers than leaders. So having said that, we've all driven here, well, many of us by cars, and what, what, is, what are the two or three simple things that we can do next week? What, so what can we do? Well, yeah, interesting question. You're right, I'd say that governments have become more sort of managers rather than leaders in the last 30 years or so. Um, but I come back to that point that it's citizen action that is really 
caused change to happen, you know, have literally, yeah, pressured governments into making change. And, you know, democratic government is not set up to make rapid change. You know, autocratic government, dictatorships are where it's at if you want to have rapid change. I'm not advocating that, <laughs> but provided our policy makers understand the risks that we're facing, I would like to think they'd be smart enough to take that action. And governments set the tone for how society works. They give price signals to business. I think the government here, for instance, could make some relatively small changes, you know, subsidising electric vehicles, for instance. A lot of these things seem controversial when they're suggested. But if we actually got on and did some of this stuff and started making the changes, that it would become normalised pretty quickly. So maybe there's a little bit of fear of the electorate out there. But I, I remain pretty confident that our government and other governments around the world can be persuaded to take pretty significant action soon. Thank you very much um, for that. Um, I just wanted to touch on what you were saying about red meat and uh, that being uh, one of the biggest uh, em emitters of a greenhouse or methane especially. Um, I think it's just important to kind of differentiate between um, grain fed, soy fed uh, beef in sort of these KFOs as opposed to uh, grass fed beef um, in regenerative farming systems where uh, you can actually sequester carbon while you're still producing food. Um, I just wanted to hear your thoughts on those kinds of approaches and whether that is at all part of the sort of those reports that you are um, part of. Okay, thanks. And it allows me to come back to the previous question. I, I actually sort of sidestepped a good part of it. I didn't really say what what is it we can do. Well, one of the main things is take some kind of political action because we do need governments to change but we can all do things ourselves you know and eating less red meat is well known to be a good thing to do both for your health and for greenhouse gas emissions but you're right it does it does vary depending on where you are how the livestock were raised and you know the the, the sort of carbon intensity of of all of that all of the processes involved so, and you know, I can't really say how, for instance, meat production in New Zealand stacks up against the US in terms of total emissions. So you do need to look a bit more closely to, to work out what effect you're having by, say, eating less red meat. But as a general rule, going to a more plant-based diet anywhere around the world is very likely to be a good thing in terms of carbon dioxide emissions. And, and all the other things about how we live our lives, you know, less air travel, um, more public use of public transport, all that kind of stuff. Anything you can do to reduce your own carbon footprint ultimately is a good thing. But in the present society we have, you, you sort of, you can do those things despite the system. It's not easy. It's not the default easy option to do something low carbon. You've got to go out of your way. It's expensive to buy an electric vehicle. Not, not everyone can afford one. It's hard work to put solar panels on your roof, even now. So if, if we can make the changes at the government level to make those kind of actions easier, I think change could come quite quickly. Right, I think that's a good note to stop on. I do apologise to those of you who weren't able to ask a question. James it will be around for a little while after the talk and there will be some refreshments. Thank you again, James, very much. Well, we've got one or two more things, actually, just a tiny little bit. We've actually got Chelsea Yeomeran here from Lincoln University Climate Change Action Group, who would like to take a few words. Where is she? There she is. Thank you very much for having me speak quickly. Um, I'm Chelsea, as Sue said, from um, the newly formed Lincoln Action Climate Group. We've been running for about two months. We're just a bunch of students who are a little bit um, sick of seeing an action on climate 
change um, and we want to do something about it, especially at universities. We believe that um, what the school kids have been striking about is amazing and we back them um, and we think it's an issue that universities need to start engaging in. Um, so we're here, we're here to work alongside Lincoln University and push for um, climate action at our university. Um, what we're doing this week, we've been running a week of climate action at uni. We've just finished I'm surprised I'm not covered in paint. We've just finished um, sign painting for the strike, which is happening on Friday. Um, hopefully you've probably seen lots of images from the latest strike all over um, the internet that happened last Friday. New Zealand's strike day is this Friday. It's happening in Cathedral Square at one o'clock, so we'll all be attending. Um, but there will be a large group of us who will be doing a hikoi, a, a walk from Lincoln University all the way into Cathedral Square. Um, if you're keen and love the sound of that, you're most welcome to join us. We will be starting at 6am. Um, so we'll see you all there. Um, otherwise, we have free buses leaving from Lincoln University at 12 o'clock to take people into the square. Um, or you can join the staff who are biking at 12, 11 o'clock. They will be leaving here at 11 o'clock and biking. So that's what's happening this week, which is really exciting. Um, I just have two more things to very quickly add. Um, thank you for your talk, James. I found it super interesting. Um, I found the, the difference between the degrees really interesting. The point I took away from that was I don't actually think it's up to us to decide whether we do the 1.5 or the three degrees, what one can we work with? Because it's actually not us who are gonna live with the consequences. So I think we need to actually do the one and a half degrees because that's the best one for the future generations. And I just really wanted to finish. You've probably all heard her amazing speech or heard of her, Greta Thunberg from Sweden, um, the most amazing 16-year-old girl who has started this movement. Um, I just wanted to finish with some of her words from her latest speech at the summit. Um, we will not let you get away with this. Right here, right now, is where we draw the line. The world is waking up. Change is coming whether you like it or not. Thank you. Thank you.